Mr. Williamson is a coming on board, looks like. Mm -hmm. If he's from the vineyard as well, or the orchard. I assume this time of year, pretty much everybody is, right? <laughs> or am I missing I something? <laughs> Admittedly, once we get done here, I actually am going to head out to the vineyard. <laughs> so, yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, everybody's kind of connecting. There's Meredith. Meredith, how are you this morning? Good. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Loud and oh, clear. Okay. All right. I'm actually on a hike right now. <laughs> oh, shit. <sure. laughs> That's why I put my picture up. <laughs> Technology, the best. The best thing ever. I know. <laughs> well, hopefully my... I didn't want to miss out. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you showing up and hopefully, um, you know, I can make it worth your time. I will make it worth your time. How about that? I'm not hopefully, I will. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> So are you pretty booked while you're in town? Yeah, pretty booked. Um, that's okay. I mean, I'm out there to help. So uh, yeah, pretty, pretty darn booked up. And, um, you know, the past month, I think has been some really, really good conversations with a lot of people in Idaho. So um, I think this is going to continue for a couple of months. I'm interested to see what, what I can do in 21. And I'm interested to see what everybody else is doing in the state of Idaho for 2021. So um, when are you in town again? Because I think I'd leave the day you get in or I wasn't able to schedule with you. Well, we can, uh, I think I'm leaving the 10th. I think I fly in the 8th and leave the 10th. Yeah. Um, but we could always talk. We can do some Zoom stuff or whatnot afterwards if, if there's something you need to discuss. Okay, I think that'd be cool. I'd love yeah. to spend some time if I could. Yeah, certainly, certainly, um, you know, we're, we've all adjusted to the COVID and hopefully post-COVID world. <laughs> hopefully we're pretty close to being done with this stuff. So uh, when you're, you're out in sunny slope. Yeah. Um, see, Larry's coming in. There's Larry. Slope on uh, what day? Like you had availability or? No. Um... He's all yeah. booked on the ninth. Oh, okay. In sunny slope. Okay, but the tenth. Yeah, I, I, yeah. If I I can make you, um, I reply back and like if you could do early on the tenth, uh -huh. but I didn't know what time you left. That, yeah, we're headed out of town, but I might be able to do an early morning, so I'll just get in touch with you on that. Yeah, do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Well, I think uh, we're good to go and I'll let uh, Joel take it away. But thank you everyone for attending and let's, let's do this. Cool. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I, I know I'd say probably about 50% of you now, maybe 60%. And uh, I'm looking forward to after today getting to know even more you all. So this is probably the third or fourth time I've given a lecture to the state of Idaho and the wine industry, which is great. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joel Perez. Uh, I'm the owner and operator of uh, Vine Advancement. And basically that's my consulting service. My day job is I'm the director of viticulture at the Institute of Enology and Viticulture of Walla Walla, where I run the vineyards. I teach all of our grape growing classes. Some of our wine classes, um, I don't teach as much wine as I would like to, but you know, you can't do everything. So we've been talking for a while about trying to see, okay, how do we help 
vineyards, but also what does that mean? And so we uh, had some discussions as far as, well, maybe we should start thinking about marketing um, and, and what that means. Because as you all probably know, good luck, good luck finding some sort of course or something about really marketing vineyards. And that's, that's a dynamic thing because, you know, wine grapes are not carrots. It's not alfalfa. They're certainly not onions. As an agricultural product, we deal with marketing like no other agricultural product does. But what does that really mean? And so, um, and even myself, I, WSU gave me this money and said, we'd love for you to study this. And then immediately um, it was evident that I probably shouldn't be in the course. And, and the instructors said the same thing. They're like, yeah, you, this is not going to help you. You're beyond this. And so we kind of went, okay, let, you know, I'll tease out some details and we'll try to start funneling this out to the, into the industry and then let people take it from there. So hopefully this is going to be worth your time. Uh, my intent is to really get you moving on some items, get you thinking maybe you're going down the right path. Maybe you're not going down the right path give you some ideas on how to move forward, um, challenge what you're doing, but also try to get you to have a warm and fuzzy about your current investment and future investments in the state of Idaho and ultimately in yourself. So that's what I wanted to do. So let's go ahead and do the screen share here. Voila. So hopefully everybody can see um, my screen here. So if there's no questions, so as far as the, the way we're gonna do this, uh, me just yammering around will probably be about 70 minutes, maybe 80. What I really, really enjoy doing, uh, it's easier when we're in person, I dig being in person, talking to people, but because we're not in person, as much as we can, I'd really like to make this, this a discussion. If you have any questions, any comments, feel free to chime in. Uh, Ashley is backseating me on this. So if you want to post a question in the chat and I miss it, she's right there to help us out. But I definitely want this to be a discussion. If there's questions, um, bring it up. If you're not quite under, understanding a concept, bring it up. I love examples. If you've ever seen one of my lectures, I love real world examples. So every single step along this way, I'm going to have an example for you. For, so you can put into, into perspective really what I'm talking about. And then hopefully, start putting that into your particular situation and start asking those very specific questions on how you're moving forward. Um, maybe you've been moderately successful on something and maybe hopefully today you can start to redefine what your success is or what your success should be. And there we go, sorry. So these were just some ideas and I kind of thought about getting this out of here, but I went, no, 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 this, this is probably the same kind of things that people are thinking. So there's always this, this uh, gentle battle between versus what it actually needs. There's always this, this, this kind of push and pull kind of thing. That's in it, there we go. And so the industry, you know, a couple of years ago had, had spoken to me. I know this was a topic of discussion before I came into the picture on needing more viticultural training. And, and that's not just in Idaho, by the way. That's a lot of places, even established AVAs in Washington. They're still kind of asking these questions. You know, uh, we, we always talk about wine, but what does, what, what role do their vineyards play into this? And, and it's sort of difficult to quantify aside from just your tonnage, aside from just how much you're producing. And so that is sort of historically taken a back seat. So although people know they might need more viticultural training and they might need some help in that perspective, they don't really know how to define that. Uh, now, what does industry actually need in respect to vineyards? Now, the traditional marketing analysis is the whole SWOT. And that's the strengths, weaknesses, um, opportunities, and threats. And, and I think that's a little bit weird personally, because when I hear threats, I think like an enemy, so to speak. And, and I think that's a strange way to think about this because in wine, there's a very real and metaphorical aspect of community here, or at least we think there is. So that, that traditional SWOT analysis sort of felt weird to me. And, you know, one of the questions for me was how do we connect the viticulture to the winemaking? How, and we have to think about this in an agronomic sense um, so in other words, what are we putting into the vineyard 
to grow uh, figuratively and literally? And then also what kind of impact are we making on the oil industry as a whole? Um, and that takes a great deal of investment and, and yes, monetary investment, of course, but knowledge investment. And this is where the rub comes. This is a rub, where the rub comes from marketing. This is where the rub comes from for production, all of it. And this is where everybody gets bogged down, gets bogged down in the science because you have, the, the world has a tremendous amount of smart people out there, very brilliant, uh, cerebral individuals with a lot of degrees. That is very, very true. Um, but you probably all know as well that you can be very, very smart in one aspect and very, you know, not so smart in another. And in fact, I have plenty of colleagues in the world of wine, uh, specifically in the world of education, that are incredible chemists and specifically wine chemists but their world is education their world is a lab and so it's incredibly difficult for them to to, to connect with the industry and that's true in everything that's you know um how do you uh, be an expert in wine trends and wine making but know the science and i mean the really in-depth science uh how can you really be a dynamic leader and engage your own business and know the good from the bad while still engaging your industry. Uh, how do you actually determine, you know, quantity and quality? Those require, all of these require different skills. And so to find all this in an industry, much less one person, is incredibly difficult. So this is where the, this is where things sort of start to slow down. Now, all the industries are trying to figure this out. This is sort of a consistent learning model. But as you pull these together, this is, these are the things you have to pull together to be able to successfully market vineyards and determine what in the world that means. You know, how are we really marketing a vineyard? So, because I was uncomfortable with the SWAT, uh, I just, it just felt funky to me. I thought I'd go with um, the five P's of marketing. Now, I don't know if this is traditional, uh, it, it certainly is a marketing aspect. Um, I think most people rely on SWAT, but I like this one. So this is how I'm going to frame today's discussion. And the first one is the product. What are you selling? And that sounds simple. Uh, it's really not. So what are you selling? Now we could talk about selling grapes, but that's the very, very rudimentary. That's a kindergarten answer. I'm selling grapes. Well, you could be selling your land. A lot of people build a vineyard in the aspect in with the idea of trying to sell a vineyard some years later and that's a that's very real um and in that respect you're kind of selling futures you're selling what is the future economic prosperity of this region why should somebody come in and invest here why should they buy my grapes why should they invest in me potentially because in the future it's going to be very very valuable and that's also investing in your region so your product can be your region uh, certainly the ABA would be your region, right? Uh, and you don't have to talk about ABAs either. It could be your state. It could be your valley. Uh, these are going to overlap, you see. But also, the product, you have to sell yourself. Again, we're not dealing with, um, we're not dealing with carrots here. We're not dealing with lentils. We are dealing with a luxury product. And although, for those of us that have to work with our hands a bit, um, Perhaps it doesn't feel very luxury all the time because we're in the industry, but make no mistake about it. Wine is a luxury product. So you better wrestle and come to grips with that idea because you have to sell that idea of luxury. And that requires you to be an, uh, an ambassador of that type of story. So you're also selling yourself. Second P, placement. Um, where are you selling your product? Certainly the ABA comes into play. We will talk a fair amount about ABA. I am adamant about how people utilize ABAs, a good, bad, and indifferent, but I, I think there's a lot of misconception in the ABAs, a lot of them. Of course, selling stuff at your estate winery, because wineries are usually inseparable from vineyards, not always, but a tremendous amount of time. 
And in that respect, it would be more of a DTC direct to consumer selling. Okay. And online, do not, like, that's not going away. Online sales are here to stay. And online sales in 2020 saved a lot of businesses, a lot. And in fact, made a lot of businesses big time. Price. How much are you selling your product for? When it comes to vineyards specifically, a lot of people will um, do themselves a disservice. We're going to go through that uh, very specifically today. Are you selling by the ton, by the acre? There's benefits for both, depending on your size. Are you selling at your own winery? So are you selling your estate grapes to the winery, even though it's right there on the property, they might be two business entities. Are you just pulling in clients? Um, and how much, how much are you selling that for? A lot of times people will sell it to the winery at a lower cost because they own the winery as well. And that could be good, that could be bad. And then a lot of times people don't price, do, do not price their varieties appropriately. They think just because they love that, that Pinot Gris, and they put so much effort into it. Well, of course it's worth $2,200 a ton. And then they get mad that nobody's buying it. Just because you love it and you put the effort into it doesn't mean it's worth that money. Um, how do you connect with customers? Uh, and this is sort of self-promotion, things I call passive and active. And then signage as well. People always forget about signage. Uh, sometimes people don't have signs. Sometimes the sign is overdone and it's, it's not really digestible. And then secondary promotions to your customers. Are your customers people buying wine? Are your customers wine makers? Is your customer your spouse, right? Maybe you're the grower and that and your spouse is the winemaker and they better believe in what you're doing. They better have a good grasp of what's going on because they're also your client. And the last one is position and position in the industry. So how is your product viewed? Again, we're in the luxury wine industry. So even though it might not feel like it to us very often, um, within the industry, do people consider you high or low? Are you known for doing bulk wine that you can find at the supermarket by the meat aisle? And if that's what your model is, that's okay. But as the industry develops and matures, is that where you're going to be in a couple of years? Is that where you want to be? And I do know people that are in that, that problem right now. They're having to redefine what their business is. So this is how I'd like to frame today's discussion. Uh, they will overlap some of these concepts. And please, I want this to be a discussion. Chime in with some ideas, some questions, and we'll move forward with this. Okay, so product, grapes, wine, What's your actual vision here? So I, I want to walk through some examples. Now, this is from Travel and Leisure Magazine. This is from 2017. I pulled it. Top vineyards around the world. All right. I'll read that one more time. Top vineyards, sorry, around the U.S. 25 businesses are listed. Most were wineries. And like I think there were three that I found that were vineyards that just happened to produce wine. It was very unclear on the websites whether they had a, web, uh, a, vine, uh, a winery on hand at the property, but ultimately they all were selling wine. That was their main marketing ploy. They were selling wine, but the vineyards looked beautiful because this was the only picture they posted on the actual, uh, with the actual article. So even though we're talking about vineyards and everything, really, the, 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 the main push here is for the wine, for the wine, for the wine. This is from uh, what's called the real world. And I didn't really hear about it too much. But when I Googled top vineyards, all that kind of stuff, this was the number two hit off of Google. And this is from 2020. Nine of the best wineries uh, to visit in the U.S. Nine of the best, even though I looked at vineyards. And yet again, the picture they're posting is of vineyards. All produced wine, and they were fancy joints, fancy. Uh, wedding venues, guided tours, restaurants, balloon rides, horse rides, crushing grapes, you name it, they had it. And when we get into different awards, this is from, I this is beverage and industry enthusiasts. This is essentially, I think, a wine enthusiast, but a step up, the same organization. When they did their yearly 
Wine Star Awards. Most of these awards are geared towards winemakers. Okay, so there's, there's this idea out there that the industry supports, by the way, that we need vineyards, but we cannot ignore the fact that we're producing wine. Yes, we're producing grapes. Yes, we're growing them. Yes, we're selling grapes. But this is, a, this is intimately connected to wine. And that's the industry we're in. So I get that you might only have a vineyard. I get that. But you need to really, really, really start thinking of this concept of, of wine growers. Because vineyards by themselves are much, much more difficult to market. And for those of you, for, for anybody, and I mean average person who's never worked in a vineyard or really been around a vineyard for a consistent amount of time, there is this blissful ignorance that the grapes kind of just do their thing. And in fact, we say that. We say that all the time. Oh, this vineyard is here. It's the perfect site. And you guys know how many websites say this. Your website might say this. You know, oh, this is the perfect site to grow grapes. We get the perfect amount of this, perfect amount of that. We say that consistently. Uh, and so that kind of generates this blissful ignorance on the effort it actually takes to produce grapes. And so there is this inherent imbalance of the marketing based off the perception, uh, as is evident by all these pretty big articles and awards, right? But as a grower, you need to come to grips with that, that even though you may not be concerned about making wine, you had better come to grips with the idea that you ultimately are producing wine. I started fumbling around with this as a joke, and then I realized it kind of made sense. And I want to walk you through this. So again, what's your vision here? What is your vision on the product, right? What are you actually selling? And I made these two uh, sort of opposite viewpoints. And so if you're a grower, you'd be on this right side, you're a grower, and this is sort of the amount of effort. And so if the triangle is all the effort throughout the year to produce and sell and make wine, the grower mainly sees and do, does this. This is their perception. You know, most of the effort is in growing the grapes. Yes, you see and work with the winemaker or winemakers. And yeah, of course they do a lot, but your perception is it's really you're 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 lifting the load. That's your perception. And then of course you know that they're selling and there's marketing but you don't deal with that as directly. So your perception is the selling and the marketing uh, is not nearly as much as what you're doing. That's a traditional perspective and that still holds true for many of us. Now, if you're the winemaker, you kind of see the opposite. If you're always in the cellar, you're checking on barrels, you're checking pHs, do you, did you top this barrel? You're doing it uh, you know, 11 months out of the year. So this is what you're seeing. Most of the effort is really on your end. Um, you deal more certainly with selling and marketing than the grower. And you know that the grower does a lot of work. You know this, but you don't see it. And again, there's this self-imposed perception that the, wine, the grapes just, they just make themselves. They just happen, right? We know this isn't true. We know this isn't true. But we also know this is a very common perception. And this is something that we all kind of have to fight against in order to define our vision and then market that vision. I want to walk you through an example. So this is Paul and Judy Shampoo. And mo many, many of you may have met uh, Paul at some point. Uh, maybe you know him personally. I met the gentleman twice and he could not have been a more kind individual he was just so such a bright shining example of a person and if you don't know his story i'm going to walk you through this because this ties into the vision i like showing an old map of the property because you can see the evolution of the washington wine industry here this is a uh, this is in the horse heaven hills region and i like driving through there because if you know where to look you can see how the vineyards evolved this vineyard was established when we didn't know how to irrigate vines we didn't know anything about drip so this was originally a center pivot irrigated vineyard as you can see and all the blue is cabernet and there's some other spots of you know malbec and this was lemberger cab franc up here but this used to be center pivot so i i like driving through there because you can see how 
the industry has evolved. It's right there in your face. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is this. So Paul, he worked for San Francisco St. Michelle, or what's now St. Michelle Wine Estates, way back in the late 70s. Um, he originally was, I think, came down and was doing some lentils with his uh, brother-in-law. And he was farming there, and St. Michelle was planting their first 2,000 acres, and so they needed a vineyard manager. He said, I could probably do it. He went and helped them out uh, in establishing that. Then he went to work for Mercer uh, Ranches and started farming their stuff. Now, at the time, Mercer was figuring out what to do as well. And they, I believe, they're the ones who originally established this vineyard. And they're going back and forth. They put a tasting room out there. Now, the Horse Heaven Hills, there's not a lot out that way. There's not a lot. So it didn't quite work out. They shut it down in 1988. And then in 96, there was a major freeze. Now, by that point, the vineyard wasn't doing very well. They had shut down the tasting room. Mercer Canyon was, uh, Mercer Ranches was trying to focus on some other endeavors. And them and the insurance company kind of went, we're out. Not worth it. And Paul saw an opportunity. He said, well, I, I think I have the skills to change this up. And if, if it's mine, then I have the leeway to change it up. I have the leeway to take it where I think it needs to go. Now, the expertise didn't really exist. He just had some inklings and he had a lot of history and he was kind of an astute person, or is, excuse me. And so he purchased it, but he knew he couldn't do it on his own. I want to say that one more time. He knew he could not do it on his own. And so he brought in five partner wineries, the pretty famous wineries, um, Cosita Creek, uh, Woodward Canyon, uh, what's, I uh, see, Powers Winery in Kenwick here, um, a Red Mountain. There was uh, what's now Hedges, the Hedges family, what's now Hedges Family Estate. And there was one more that I kind of forget. But these, back then, there wasn't a heck of a lot of wineries then. I think then there was only maybe still 30 wineries, maybe, maybe, maybe 40 in the state. So there wasn't a lot. There wasn't a lot of expertise. So this idea of community. And by the way, a lot of these guys went to school together. So there's this baseline communal effort and consistent respect on what they're trying to do. And so he brought them in not only to make sure he had a source for his grapes, but sort of to, from the very beginning, think about, I need these people, I need these partners to sell the wine to market, to market these ideas, to, to push forward. And uh, so in 2002, Cosita Creek, uh, through a Wine Advocate, got the first 100-point wine uh, from, for the state of Washington. In fact, it got a perfect score in 2003, 2005, 2007. And those grapes came from Paul Shampoo Vineyards. Um, and so this really set a stage for the state of, state of Washington. This set a, a level uh, which everybody has tried to emulate since then on how you run a vineyard, um, the basics of running a vineyard, how you form a relationship between the winemaking community and the grape growing community, and how you communally market that vision. And that vision was, at least for Paul in his own words, his vision was, uh, we watch the nutrients, we watch the water, and we make really good relationships with our winemakers. That's the vision, and that's the product. So if you're only a grape grower right now, or if you're only a winemaker, or you're doing both, define that vision and push forward that vision and recognize, although we are very independent people, trying to do it alone, you're going to have a hard time. At least that's my two cents on it. The reality these days is most of us do this. If you're a grower, you're still kind of dealing with marketing. Maybe you don't recognize it. Maybe you don't want to do it, but you have to do it. Uh, you, why does somebody want to buy from you? You know, is, is there something you're doing different? Do they just know you? Are you selling cheap grapes? So they're like, listen, I can buy the grapes at half price there and I can tweak it in the winery. But you're having to market it in some respect. If you're making the wine, of course, you already know you're having to market. I mean, winemakers are always at events talking about what they're doing, or what they did in the barrel. And I don't know a lot of winemakers who like to market but I do know just about every winemaker has to market. It's part of the game, right? And then of course, 
if you're an actual, you know, uh, distributor, if you're selling wine in front of the house, you're a tasting room manager. Yeah. Marketing is your gig and you may have not ever thought about it, but you are an ambassador. You are the face. What you say will be held as gospel by the people that come in. So what you're saying, even though you don't remember it, they will remember it good, bad, or indifferent. I've had, I, I've been in a lot of tasting rooms as you all have, and it's a little bit of a mental game. It takes the brain about two to four seconds to remember something bad. It's an evolutionary idea, right? We need to know that fire's bad, don't touch. It takes the brain about 15 to 20 seconds of repetition to remember good things. So I have a very hard time remembering awesome, really good experiences or, or okay experiences, tasting rooms, but I remember every bad experience in a tasting room. I have a student, he goes, I used to play a lot of poker. I don't remember any of my good hands, but I remember my bad hands. I remember those bad hands really good. So when you are out there marketing, be on point, know your vision, know what you're talking about. In this environment, there's a heck of a lot more wineries and vineyards out there than they were uh, in the 2020s in the 19s, excuse me, in the, in the, in the 2000s, in the 2090s, or sorry, 1990s, 1980s, you see where I'm going with this. So what somebody accomplished 20, 30 years ago is not going to be the model that you should be following right now because the environment is different, the industry is different, your consumer is different. There are many more businesses out there for you to compete with or set yourself apart from. So know what you're doing, know what your vision is, know who you are. Remember, you're selling yourself. Do you, do not, my, my opinion is you need to really start using this term wine grower. You really do, in my opinion, uh, because that, that signals a unified effort, that signals a unified vision. And your clientele is going to go, what do you mean by wine grower? Oh, well, you know, I run this vineyard. I do this, whatever else. Da, da, da. But I am farming specifically for wine. And here are my winemakers. Boom, 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 boom. And they do this. And here's their story. And you can find them here. And on the opposite side, on the winemaking side or in the tasting room side, you know, we, we get our grapes from this vineyard. Okay, well, why do you get them there? Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Well, what's fantastic about it? Uh, know what's fantastic about it. Well, we go there because that family's been there for a hundred years and their Cabernet, they grow it in this manner and they, they farm it at this crop level. And that allows us to consistently get the tan and the structure that we want at this time of year. And they're just great people. You see this guy and you want to give him a big old hug and you know, the, the, the lady who's the owner, she comes this way and he just, you know, you love these people. That's what you need to know. You need to know why you love them. Because if you do, the clientele will. So what is your story? And remember that you're also selling yourself in this. Don't ever forget that. You are selling yourself. If I was given this lecture right now in a sequenced see-through tank top, uh, you might be less inclined to pay attention right? I am selling myself. As I speak to you right now, I am selling myself. A little bit more about this. Uh, these are sort of some ideas I, I want you all to think about. This isn't really a high, hard science, but this is more of a just get your mind rolling. And so I started thinking about what kind of things do people uh, have to engage in actively and what are some things that help to define the product that are perhaps a little bit more passive, but that have potential. On the active side, certainly engaging your AVA. Uh, and what is your AVA? What's the vision of your AVA? Uh, is it a notable AVA? Is it a newly established AVA where people don't really know what to make of it? Uh, is, was the AVA established because more of a local initiative? Or was it established because a lot of people came together and said, we're gonna make, we're doing something great. Let's make sure we're doing something great and let's go to the next level. Of course, engaging your clients, whether your clients are your, are your uh, winemakers or your clients are your wine buyers. Um, actively engaging your chemistry in your environment. And, I, and this is something that I've been giving lectures on. And this is something that uh, my consultations have been focusing more and more on. Again, we think that these vines just do their own thing. 
And we always talk about this concept of terroir, right? Uh, you know, what the land and the environment is doing. But we always ignore the human element of terroir. And that is that when you leave strip, how you you're feeding the vine. What are you feeding the vine? How are you changing your soil chemistry? When are you harvesting? Every single one of those things. What's the toast on your barrel? How large is your barrel? All of those will define your wine and they will start to reinforce your vision if you're doing it correctly. But that takes effort and that takes time. And all that falls in line with your marketing concept, your vision. They have to be in concert with each other. Some of the more passive ideas here, uh, tourism. This is a big one, tourism. And I, I put enotourism and ecotourism. That's not the traditional ideas, but I want you to really think about that enotourism. When I was in Spain, um, the concept of tourism, they were coming to grips with this thing. And I was in Rioja and it was a very interesting discussion. I had a two day discussion. It, didn't, it wasn't supposed to be professional. I was there for vacation in a very, very depth professional discussion with one person and about six winemakers. It was very, it was fantastic. But what had happened was they had some, so, some restrictions sort of change and they had a new influx of younger winemakers and half of them da, 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 were American. And so they wanted to sort of do things differently, right? And so they were developing these ideas or at least pushing forward with these ideas of why does somebody want to come to here? I'm in Rioja, but what, what do I do to get people to come to my spot specifically? And what do I do to get people to stay here to where they're maybe just not buying a bottle of wine? Maybe they're buying two or three, four, a case of wine. And then I can send with Is there things in this exact region that will keep them here for other region, reasons? A uh, biking route. Are they doing some sort of wine tour? Are there, how many people are touring here? Is there a passport system? And I think Idaho's thinking of a passport system where people can get these ideas and go around and get stamps and promote wineries and, and a wine trail. So these young Americans were pushing these ideas and the Spaniards were going, this is weird. I don't get it, but it seems to be working. I think I need to rethink this whole thing. So it was a very interesting concept. And I had some very interesting conversations with these people. And one of them was an economist. And he goes, this is something we've never thought about. Well, this is something that Idaho is probably already thinking about. And I think from the grower's perspective, recognize this. You maybe don't have the time to engage this or even the winemaking perspective, but define it, see what's out there. Is there a biking route that happens to go past your winery? Are you catering to bikers? Not bikers and as in Harleys, I'm talking about like, you know, road bikes, 10 speeds, okay? Maybe you reach out to them a little bit. What other things as far as ecotourism? Is there something in your winery? Uh, you know, Mr. Bittner, I know he, he talks a lot about uh, pollinators and things like that. I do a lot of native plants. Those kind of things people wanna see, they wanna hear about that. How are you being a good steward of the land? How are you connecting to other industries? What's your neighborhood doing? And then also, uh, more passively, what is your visibility? Uh, I will show you this more when we talk about one of the other P's, but when people drive by, they, do they know you're a winery? Do they know you're a vineyard? What's their impression as they drive by? Some of these people will only have 10 seconds to drive by. Were they able to read your sign? I was actually, I didn't end up going there. But I drove past a winery I had never been before locally, and their sign, their main sign on the road was one of those large flags, you know, the large flags that kind of go like this, and it's right here. But the flag was blown in the wind the whole time. So if I had never been there, and I had never been there before, but I knew where it was, but this is, if this is my first time there, and I can't even read the flag, which is the sign, you're already starting off on the wrong foot. So everything you do passively, you know, things that you're not going to deal with every day, things that you're not going to even deal with every week or month, if it's passive, it needs to be self-sustaining. So if you have a sign, make sure it's digestible, it's readable. If people drive by your vineyard all the time, make sure the parts that they see are freaking immaculate. 
I don't care if in the back you have issues. I mean, I care. Don't get me wrong. I do care. But that passive marketing needs to be self-sustaining because you're not going to be able to do all this, right? You, but you need to recognize there's an element of this passive marketing that happens every day. And as I say this, I can even see some of you are all kind of shaking your heads going, oh, shoot, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. That's good. That's good. I, I make mistakes all the time. I, I do. But it's in the recognition of those mistakes that we grow and we get better and we move to the next level. You're, I'm going to talk about the next one placement and i'm going to spend a little time on aba and this is where i want a lot of discussion so before i get to placement are there any questions on product any ideas that have been generated these will overlap so you'll see sort of a reemergence of some of these items here we've already i already mentioned aba but any questions to this point okay cool we'll move on placement the second p does your aba work for you have you ever thought about it? Maybe, yeah, maybe you haven't, but I'm gonna tell you right now, you should. Your ABA should be working for you, it can work for you. Um, and if you don't know how, this is why we're here, this is why we're discussing this. Find out what your local ABA association does. What are they supposed to be doing? Uh, how much marketing do they do? They do? I, I, I don't wanna tell you, where, but there is a, a an ABA association that I I haven't dealt much with, but I checked out the website and I realized why I remembered why I don't deal much with them because the website for the local association, although there was a link on the side with all the different vineyards there, and wineries, the website was essentially a self promotion for the family who started the ABA, um, which is a little weird, and I re I remembered why I don't deal with them a lot. Um, so is a local association working for the industry how are they marketing are they offering training and that's something that more and more ABAs, uh well, local winery associations are, are starting to get into um providing local specific training uh what are your annual dues are you getting your money's worth are you paying annual dues these associations don't just run on voluntary work and it takes time to run this it takes time to hire people the right people to run web run websites do evaluations hire train trainers okay so uh, be willing to pay, but also make sure you're getting your money's worth. Now, all of these are different business models, right? You have a, a vineyard, and this person might have a vineyard, but the vineyards are different sizes. You're at different locations. This vineyard has a winery. This place is only a winery. All different business models. But as a region, you should have some sort of unified vision, some sort of mantra, something that defines you all in that place specifically to that place that reinforces why the ABA is what it is so you're kind of going to what is the ABA doing and then what is it doing for my business you don't have to uh be exactly like your neighbor you you probably don't want to be but you do have to have some sort of unified uh mantra that you can all kind of rally around so i want to walk through some examples here with you i love examples Okay, so pay attention here. Which of these definitions helps you define your business, product, which we just talked about, and your market? Okay, these are real ABAs. Oops, first one. Encompassing more than a third of the state, it is by far the largest growing region at nearly 11 million acres. 59,234 acres under uh, of vines or vineyards, over 30 different wine grape varieties at five to 22 inches of rain. That's a real definition. I got it off the websites. It's a real location. Here's example two. Now remember, think about this in, in relation to the question, which of these definitions helps you to define your business, your product and your market? Here's a second location. One of the smallest areas of wine production in the region, representing 0.07% of the total area under vines. 2,009 acres of vineyards, 138 estate vineyards growing Merlot at 80%, Cabernet Franc at 15%, and Cabernet Sauvignon at 5%. I think 
example two sounds a heck of a lot better for defining your product, defining your market, defining your business. And I think you all would agree, right? Anybody want to take a stab at either one of these? I'll show you. But anybody want to take a stab at where these AVAs are? Hey, Jim. Yes. I'm going to guess maybe one is the Columbia Basin. Who was that, Patrick? Yeah. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> Mr. Williamson for the win. <laughs> Who wants to guess on number two? Okay, that's all right. Ready? Columbia Valley. Columbia Valley. Now, I have two examples of the Columbia Valley. We're going to walk through this, okay? Now, I want to throw in a caveat here. Columbia Valley produces a heck of a lot of grapes and a heck of a lot of wine. I live in the Columbia Valley, okay? As you can see, it encompasses a third of the whole state. Kind of hard not to live in the Columbia Valley. A lot of you buy grapes from the Columbia Valley. So this is not a horrible thing, but I'm asking you to look into this with, with goggles on, the idea of how does this work po in a positive manner for you or how can it work better for you? So this is straight off their uh, Wine 101 introduction primer to marketers, 11 million acres. I got that straight off of there, established in 88. There's a total acreage there in hectares and in acres. Remember, you know, marketing is not just within the U.S. Um, top varieties. Now, they only list a couple, and they do that for marketing purposes. But going into your business, marketing over 30 grapes. First of all, they, they said on another part, that they're all, they're all premium grapes, over 30 of them. That's a very difficult thing to quantify and qualify. It is incredibly difficult. And it says six to eight inches, but we know that's not true, as you'll see soon. And as you probably already know, six to eight inches in a lot of these regions, sure. But there's a lot of these outskirts, almost all the outskirts that get way more than that. Second location, palm roll. Palm roll is in Bordeaux. Palm roll is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful spot. And you can just read through there. They're very specific what, about what they do now. This is a very small location. It's basically a village. It's basically a village. And it's freaking gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I rolled through there one time with a buddy of mine. I didn't realize where I was at. He's like, you want to stop? I go, no, we're okay. And about a year later, I kicked myself. I didn't realize what I was doing. But they define what they grow, they define what they do, and yes, there is more government regulation there, get it. But marketing and really honing in on that makes it so much easier for them to tell the world that they're awesome and to make the world believe that they're awesome. Now, I'm gonna fall back on the Columbia Valley as I talk about this portion here, the Columbia Gorge. Um, I love the Columbia Gorge as a region. I love going there. Uh, on the Oregon side right here is the town of Hood River. Hood River is amazing. Taste of, room, taste of rooms, wineries, uh, world-class windsurfing. Awesome. Great place. Great, great place. It's fairly small. There's about uh, a little under a thousand acres of vineyards and most of that is on the Oregon side. And you can see it just has a couple varieties here. Now this is on the Washington wine website, 10 to 36 inches of rain. Again, there's this dramatic change, right? Now here's where things start to kind of tumble out of control. This is what the Hood River area looks like. Amazing, green, hilly. Uh, I, I guess technically there's no fjords, but I guess there's what I would call fjords there. Um, again, amazing windsurfing hikes. I go out through hikes out there and I always run into some sort of waterfall. Gorgeous. That's what one side of it looks like. And the other side looks like this, which could be any one of our vineyards, right? It's dry, it's hot, which it works in our favor. Um, there's a river. And so we're being asked to believe inside the industry and outside the industry 
that this makes sense as one single AVA. We're being asked to believe this. Now, let me take this one step further. Remember, we're talking within our industry right now. So I want you all to think about what is your ABA doing for you? What do you expect the ABA to do? How do you catapult this vision into a consistent and successful marketing ploy? This is what the Washington Wine, Wine Commission says. This is what the actual winery association says. Um, they have all this different stuff. They have cool mountains. Um, flowing from east, uh, eastward from the ocean, bringing 50 inches of rain, 50 inches of rain, uh, foothills of the Cascades and dropping a little as 10 inches uh, to the region uh, in the arid eastern area. So it's saying closer to 50 inches here, 10 inches here, which is more, it's different from what the Wine Commission is saying. We have a 50, roughly a 50-50 split on uh, white and reds. And of course, most of the reds are being produced on the north side, on the Washington side. Most of them are. And I was there a couple of years ago speaking with at the, the association's meeting. And uh, it went very, very, very well for me. They were like, they, we never heard this before. Thank you. We'd love to talk to you about this. You know, it, in fact, one guy got up and he, he got a call from, he was, he was a volunteer for the local firefighters association. And he told me, he goes, Joel, I apologize, I have to go. He goes, but I, I'll tell you right now in front of everybody, this is the best talk we've ever had. I go, hey, well, great, I'm here to help. So I appreciate that. After I got done, we started eating, then they all started their normal meeting. And every single person was discussing what we're discussing now. What is their vision? What are they doing? My location doesn't look like your location. How are we in the same AVA? The Columbia Gorge, name-wise, sounds like Columbia Valley. And for outside agencies, they don't know the difference. We are saying we do things differently. We're showing things differently. Uh, when they send their representatives to pour at events in Seattle and they're dealing with sommeliers or dealing with all these different you know, um, vendors and they go, oh, you're from the Columbia Valley. And they go, no, 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 we're from the Columbia Gorge. But also some of their wines, because you can buy grapes a couple miles down the way, some of their wines have to say Columbia Valley. So now there's further confusion. And by the way, you buy grapes in Columbia Valley. Remember, Columbia Valley is all this area here, right? You buy grapes in Columbia Valley. What does that say? Where are your grapes from? Are they from down here in the Horse Heaven Hills? Or are they from way up here closer to Chelan? So the, they're having a hard time marketing what they do in the Columbia Valley. And they're, a hard, they're having a hard time fighting uh, their relationship and name-wise to Columbia, sorry, Columbia Gorge and Columbia Valley. Like, it's just confusion all over the, the place. And within the ABA, you know, you have a lot of rain, super green, mostly whites on this side, mostly reds on this side. And then this is basically like what we do out here. So there's so much confusion inside and there's so much confusion outside and they don't know how to, how to fix it. They will. They'll figure it out. They're smart people. They will. But this is a common thing when it comes to ABA. This is very, very common. Uh, and, and in fact, the discussion got so kind of awkward. One grower kind of leaned over to me nonchalant and, and she went, welcome to the Columbia Gorge. And I was like, do I need to come back? I don't know. I want to, but I'm kind of afraid now. I want to throw out a fourth example for you. So we talked about Columbia Valley, Palm Roll, Columbia Gorge. Here's a fourth example, Candy Mountain. This is one of our newest ones. It has a little under a thousand acres. Now, here's the thing. There's about 970 acres from one business. One business. Do you see where I'm getting with this? So, although within this new ABA, there's no confusion at all within the wine industry there's a slight bit of confusion as far as what should they say about the ABA and right now it's basically we shouldn't say anything about the ABA we'll buy grapes no problem we'll do this but it's it's confusing outside because you don't know basically are you going to market that one business because the ABA is essentially one business 
Now, from the state's perspective, the large grand scale, of course you should say something. So Steve Warner's, you know, hey, it's small, or they're doing some cool stuff. And there are some pretty awesome wineries that buy grapes from there, have been buying, buying grapes from there for a while. But it's very obvious that that ABA was pushed. In fact, if you look at the documents, it's one business hired one guy to do this. And you can, you can, that's perfectly legal. But it behoove you as you're defining your industry to really think about your approach to AVAs. How are they working for you? Can they work against you? What is the vision? What is your product? And how does that define your placement in business? So, you know, think about your, your, your boundaries. Do they make sense? Do they translate into grape and wine sales? Um, too many grapes, too many grapes is a very difficult sell. And so I mentioned a couple of them, uh, these organizations, WSET, that's a Wine and Spirits Education Trust, uh, Psalm Guild, uh, Master of Wine Organization. If you study any courses through these organizations and you come to, uh, first of all, you, you won't find Idaho yet, yet. And I, and I, I, I mean that. I, I, I personally have a vision for Idaho as, as little as I am. But you go to things that you think should be in there, uh, the Willamette Valley, the Columbia Valley. The Columbia Valley eclipses Willamette Valley as far as production, eclipses. And yet, in every single one of these world organizations, the marketing and the definition and the drive from these organizations in defining the Pacific Northwest mainly falls upon the Willamette Valley. Because the Willamette Valley has defined what they do. It's mainly Pinot Noir, some Chardonnay, get it. But that's easy for these outside secondary promotion, secondary marketing organizations to define and to push forward. It's very difficult, extremely difficult to market 11 million acres and over 30 premier wine grapes. That's very difficult to market. And you all know that's very difficult to make as far as wine with all those right. We all wanna do everything, right? but you're diluting your effort. And in the vineyard, you're also diluting your effort there. It is tough to farm many, many different varieties. So really think about where your direction is and how much you're doing. And that's gonna help you to be able to speak intelligently about all this. If you really know how to speak intelligently about it, then you're going to be able to, to be that, that um, that sponsor, that consistent sponsor of the vision of the product, of the placement, of the location, of the, you know, all of those things. Establishing an ABA, uh, there's going to be more ABAs in Idaho. There will. There's probably a couple under being written as we speak, probably. And it's expensive to go through this product process. You know, it can be as little as twenty-five thousand dollars, and that's fairly cheap. Um, it could be as much as fifty thousand dollars. In fact, it probably could be much higher than that. So make sure that your money is well spent, because essentially you're betting on futures. You're betting on how are we going to improve the industry and bring more people here, buy more wine, establish establish, establish more businesses, establish a stronger local economy, especially for rural communities. Rural communities have been going down for decades. So, again, be that ambassador for yourself, for your business, for your region, for your economy. Do you have a plan right now or are you just planning to pl have a plan? Questions about placement in ABA. I hope this is generating some ideas. I hope this is kind of getting your brain moving. I really do. Yes. Um, kind of in the chat here, I did ask, since you were talking about AVA associations doing some kind of training, could you elaborate on that a little bit more as to like what kind of training would an AVA association do? Is it just training customers and, and, and wineries just to what to talk, kind of giving them uh, talking points or, or? Part of that, part of that, uh, last year, no, shucks, 2019, excuse me, 2019, um, at the school, we worked with our local uh, winery association in Walla Walla to put on a, a, a tasting room trainer uh, course. And we called it a tasting room, uh, tasting ambassador course is what we, just, uh, we called it. And so it was a weekend thing. It was about four hours on the Saturday and four hours on the Sunday. 
And the first hour was just teaching tasting room people about the ABA. So they actually know what's going on. They actually know what, what wineries are there, uh, rainfall, what impact that has on stuff, what's the dominant varieties, um, the difference between varietal and variety. Um, and then we got into other things, you know, specific to tasting rooms, uh, pouring, um, the history of your business, verbiage, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, other training could be viticulture, obviously being a viticulture guy, uh, stuff specific to your region. You know, if you are in a colder region, your, pr your pruning needs to be different. And so you need perhaps the, something like that's very important for you. Uh, soil management, you know, in the South, you deal with a lot of calcareous soils and that soil management is different from somewhere else. So that's gonna take some regional specific training. Um, and I would also, uh, also talk about economic training. That's a big one. That's a big, big, big one. Mo most of our businesses lack in official economic training, taking courses like that. So, you know, sky's the limit, but I will say that specific regional training is probably more useful than larger scale training, in my opinion. Any other Any questions? questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I understand the, the, you know, one ABA too big, one ABA too small, but an ABA done right, doesn't there some specific evidence that uh, this creates distinction uh, for the wines from that ABA and also um, the ability really to, to raise prices and, and make the make yes. The money, you know, more money? Yes, Mr. Harless. Yes, That's indeed. What we're really talking about here. Yes. So I get to that um, in about 15 minutes. I have some specific, I'm going to go through numbers for you. And yes, that, that is absolutely true. When it's done right, this can be a tremendous jump off point for marketing. Definitely. Where the rub comes in is where you don't have that unified vision, where you don't have, um, you know, at the very least say, you know what, the dominant grape that we grow in this area is this. At the very least, say some, saying something like that, or saying things like, this is a big one in France right now, and this is a big one in, in Napa Valley. Uh, everybody around here is organic, or everybody around here is, 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 or has a heavy biodynamic leaning. Whatever that unified vision is, that's, that has to go in concert with the definition of the ABA. It has to. So um, like in Milton Free Water right now, or the Rocks District, their thing is, they, uh, they're stones, right? They're, they're, they're rocks and Syrah. That's their unified vision. They do some other things. Everything else is secondary to the stones and the rocks. So if you don't have that baseline vision, it's harder to do everything else. And that baseline vision, yes, you're absolutely right, Tim. It can, when you're doing everything else right, which we'll talk about, catapult your prices forward. And that's really where we want to be. We are in a luxury market and we need to be in a position where we're commanding luxury prices. So yes, you're correct. Anything else? And we will get to that, sir. Definitely. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, There's Dana? a question from Haley in the chat. Um, do, 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 I, oh, there we go. Yep. Yay, chat. Uh, okay, so Haley was asking, from a marketing perspective, perspective, do you have some resources to help hone those focuses? From a marketing perspective, Haley, let's, let's um, if I don't answer that at the end of this lecture, let's bring it up at the end of the lecture, because I, I think what we're going to talk about today will get everybody's brains moving. And if I don't have a direct answer, the chances are somebody else is going to come up with various answers here. Um, so let's, cool. So let's, let's revisit that at the end of the lecture. And if I don't, chime in. Okay. Hey, cool. uh, before yes. we move on real quick, I, I just, I think this might be a good spot. Maybe you're going to touch on this a little bit later. Um, but because you're talking about like boundaries and, and like placement. Yeah. Is there pros and cons to de determining 
uh, AVA establishment and where to place boundaries? Should you just yeah. limit it to geological or if there's a historic wine uh, trail association and using like that boundary or even making sure that property, you know, that winery properties aren't being cut in half or anything like that? Is that? Ooh, that's a great question, Pat. That's a very astute question. So here's the federal answer. Uh, because I, I hope to sooner than later start getting into writing these AVAs, these AVA petitions, because there's some nice, there's some nice cheddar there. And as I started pulling the documents from the federal side, I went, yeah, I could do this. This is easy enough. Here's the federal answer. Uh, they don't care where your businesses are. And they are uh, the gatekeepers. They care where the geological separation is. The petitions are written off of geological information. And all that geological information these days is online. You can find it, you know, web soil survey, uh, geological mapping, you know, all these kind of stuff. The federal government cares about where the geological separation is. And yes, there are locations where it goes straight through businesses. In fact, there's a very famous, uh, I won't say the businesses, but there's a very famous series of fights in the exact scenario you, you proposed um, in what is now the Rocks District because that did that those district lines uh went right through some established businesses there right through and then legally those people couldn't say that they were in the ava um the other sort of rub there was that the there were some questions on why would we use these geological boundaries why don't you just move the geological boundaries like instead of using the specific calcareous soil why don't you use a different soil structure there i uh, so from the federal side they don't they don't care whatever the geological uh boundary you're using that's what they're caring about from the local perspective i'd say uh be very weary of that because i i find it hard to believe that you couldn't find some sort of geological rationale um to where you would not be cutting through people's properties i i, I I, I personally would not feel good about that. And I, I would try my best to find some sort of different soil structure or whatever else it was to move a boundary if I thought that I was cutting off somebody's uh, business. Hey, Joel. Yes, Mike. Yeah, hey, this, this question speaks right to where I was thinking about as well. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, like a traditional growing region down here and um, uh, there's been lots of talk about um, creating a new, I'm going to say it, like the sun and slope, uh, like an AVA. Let's talk about that for a long time. I've heard that. And, and um, I would like to see it, but then I think about, like, there has to be a lot of work that goes into uh, including, because there's, the, I, I think the more difficult part, but it's probably easier to find a geologic uh, condition that is going to include my friends that because it's I think it's harder to get people as one mind to get so that we can get uh, the consistent message that's a more difficult job than yeah finding a geological uh, continuity I agree I agree kind of going back to that last point there do you have a plan or do you plan to have a plan like are you are you planning to fix it in the future you know uh, when it comes to because although we have our own businesses we're still part of a community I mean, yeah. we're all here right now and uh i have i have to prioritize my business and my family but gosh darn it i don't know if i'd be able to sleep that night if i knew that i was never negatively impacting my neighbor i agree with you i i fully agree with you that um getting everybody on the same page is difficult i would say that you don't need to have all the details together but let's at least agree that we should be we should set some boundaries well beyond our own personal boundaries so that leaves room for us to grow and that also leaves room for for newbies to come in mm -hmm. they can be part of our community that would be my answer and i agree with it i i, I agree with you completely okay thank you yep yeah. okay let's push on from here i have a couple more in regards to placement direct to consumer and online Okay, uh, this isn't going away. Like I said, online sales saved a lot of people's butts this past year, big time. Uh, but where are you? 
direct to consumer, are you selling out of your tasting room? Are you selling at your vineyard? Like you're obviously you're selling your fifth century vineyard, but if somebody's coming out of their way to see you, you better be ready to roll out the red carpet. Again, this is a luxury industry. If you are the only vineyard in 75 miles, then when they get there, you better have some stuff set up. You better have the answers for them. You better tell them who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, what you're growing, why you are badass. Why did they just drive 75 miles to come see you? How many acres are you growing? Uh, what's your legacy? Why are you there? Why are you doing this? Is this, are you farming this because your grandfather farmed this and your great grandfather farmed this and you feel a very strong sense of pride and connection to the land. That's worth saying. That is worth saying. And as soon as they drive up, there better be something there that already speaks to the history because they went out of their way to talk to you. So in that respect, uh, this is a, a skyward picture of the Sedane project down on the southern side of the Walla Walla Valley, pretty famous vineyard is run by a good buddy of mine, Sadie Drury, who uh, runs this place as about as well as anybody could. Got a lot of money behind it, which is great, but she works her butt off. She really does. She's amazing. And a lot of famous wineries and winemakers uh, bought these plots. So it's one property, one uh, management, North Slope Management, many different uh, vineyards that are, they say owned, but they're basically still vetted by wineries, like 20 year leases essentially. I'm sure there's more legal mumbo jumbo than that. But as you arrive here, it's not very impressive necessarily. It's an old, there's an old grain silo. But then you drive up and you see this, you're, you're just, you're driving up, 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 and you get here. And there's this platform specifically meant for people to look down over the valley. And you can see the entire valley. You can see the expanse, not really all the way up to Spokane, but you can see pretty far up the Palouse. You see the base of the, uh, you see all through the uh, the blues, the mountain range, immediately to your right. You can see all the way through the Tri-Cities. You can see on a really good day, Red Mountain. And you can see some of the, uh, the Cascades, uh, excuse me, not the Cascades. Yeah, the Cascades on a really good day. So this view was meant to impress. So when somebody drives through all the little, you know, uh, all the other vineyards and through Milton Free Water, and then they get to the very apex of what's happening and they go this is why i came out here if a picture's worth a thousand words you go up there and you're seeing a whole book and also as you're driving up and you're driving past these plots it's very very obvious who owns what this is that passive marketing that i've been talking about when you're not there is your product speaking for you already so if you haven't thought about signage before, think about it now. Get it going. Because you don't have the time every day or every week or every month to worry about our people recognizing where you are and who you are. Spend a little money, make an easily digestible sign and throw it up at the right location. And I think that's the last slide on placement, I believe. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 yes, yes. I remember what I did here, okay. I want to give you one more example. This, now this looks like, th this picture doesn't do it justice. I actually should have put it in my own pictures, actually. I was here about a month ago. This is a winery called Hard Road to Ho. Has anybody ever heard of Hard Road to Ho in Chelan? Okay, I see a couple shakes, great. Um, if you heard of it, if you, if you know them personally, uh, after this lecture, tell them I, I, I spoke tremendously well about them. Uh, I went there. And I struck up a great conversation with the son Julian, and it was just a very, very pleasant trip. Uh, you drive up there, and this gets into, into placement and unif unification of vision. Uh, the vision wasn't necessarily, in this case, on their AVA, but it was in the business specifically on the location. So uh, a nice winery. They do about 5,000 cases, I think winery and tasting room surrounded by all their vineyards. You can see the Lake Chelan off in the distance. This is the road you take up to the winery, immediately surrounded by all their vineyards. Um, and I met uh, Don, the owner, some years back. He wouldn't remember me, but his mustache stood out to me. Uh, and I think everybody remembers his mustache. And he's uh, not, a, not a tall gentleman, He's quite the opposite, but he is just, in, you just kind of sink 
into who this gentleman is. You're like, who is this character, right? So nice. And like I said, I, I struck up a very nice conversation with the son, uh, Julian, and he, he, the guy didn't need to, but he just treated me like a king. And I think hopefully he enjoyed the time as well because passion breeds passion. And I had some very good questions about his business, about what they were doing. And he saw that and he goes, well, what do you do? Uh, but the reason why I bring this up is because of their story. Hard Road to Ho, they used to have a different name and they were doing okay. And this is some years ago. And then Ron decided to go with the story of the location of the placement. And that location used to be the location of a cat house, right? A, a, a whorehouse way back in the days, the early 1900s, when people were doing a lot of logging out there. And so most of the logging was done, I believe, on the opposite side of the uh, lake. And so all the loggers would row across to this side of the lake to go have a good time in the evening, right? So Ron goes, I'm going to use it. And he changes the name to Hard Road to Ho. Play on words, right? And everywhere you look on the property, the signage uh, where you're drinking inside, everywhere the name is there. Every aspect of this business, the physical placement of this business speaks to the vision, speaks to the marketing, everything. It's everywhere you go. And it's funny. It doesn't have, you don't have to be funny, okay? But it's good. In fact, he told me, he goes, once I changed the name, my sales just shot through the roof. And they, because of the location, because of the AVA, because of their name, because of their vision, they do, this is what they told me. Okay, I don't have the numbers to prove, but they told me they do about 95% of their sales direct to their customers straight out the door and about nine months out of the year. That's the goal, ladies and gents. That's the goal. That's the vision, right? We can't all be that lucky. But if you have this vision, if you have these stories, if you know who you are, if you have the proper placement, if you have the proper signage, you can certainly improve what you're doing. And let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, we can all improve on what we're doing, myself included. Questions about placement. I just thought that was a cool story. Hopefully you guys bought it and then you buy some wine there. <laughs> All right. So if anybody knows Don, tell him I spoke highly of him and his son, Julian. So for product and placement, uh, both need to match. You try your best to match them up. Know what you're selling. You're selling your grapes, selling your wine, selling yourself, your region, your history, all that good stuff. Know your AVAs. Know how to speak about the AVAs. Know what they're doing for you. Uh, know, you know, if you need to, if something's not working for you, you need to engage your AVA, your local winery association. Um, what's being produced from there. Make sure your tasting room staff. Make anybody who can be an ambassador, make sure they speak like an ambassador at all times. Make sure you have that unified vision. And I, I hear I put common tongue. If your common tongue's Cabernet, cool. Your, caver, your common tongue is Tempranillo, cool. If your common tongue is organics or whatever, cool, roll with it. Make sure you're all on the same page. Ultimately, what is your story, all right? So I wanna move on to the next P because we can't be here all morning, right? I wanna get into pricing here, pricing. Now, this came from a document that I had that was quote unquote confidential. I really don't know why it was confidential, but it was. Uh, and I tweaked some stuff here. And this is from 2019. These were suggested prices per ton going in to the 2019 season. Now, some of you might look at this and go, that seems kind of low. But keep in mind that a tremendous amount of production in, in the Columbia Valley, which is a third of the state, um, is not necessarily what we would call in the higher end. A lot of it just kind of go, went to large scale operations and ultimately got blended away. So that sort of drives down some of the average. But for some of these, this might make a little bit of sense. Okay, uh, now this list was also, here's something to keep in mind, it was put together by people who were not buyers. They were not buyers. So they, they, the idea was to not have too much of a stake in the game and they could bring an unbiased opinion. That was the idea. It was just a guideline. You go above and below something to kind of help you out to give you a general compass reading on where you're moving. Now, highly dependent on your AVAs. Uh, 
places like Red Mountain and Walla Walla, which is certainly the most famous AVAs in Washington, can certainly go for three times these prices, certainly. And that goes into what Tim was saying earlier, if it's done right, you can command higher prices. And this also doesn't factor in uh, contractual agreements and variations there. And can contracts, I've been delving a lot into contracts lately, there's a lot there. And you know, you can go for as low as $4,000 an acre if you're doing per acre, and you can break that down per ton, to as much as $12,000 per acre, and in some cases slightly higher. Now this is what they actually went for on average, on average. So some of them went a little bit higher. Uh, again, this is the average. So there's, there's this big bulk location that are sort of driving down this average, but certainly Cabernet, we would expect a, a slightly higher price. Uh, Merlot, okay, we do a ton of Merlot. Pinot Noir, look at the difference between Pinot Noir and what they would say it'd go for. And this probably factors into the idea that maybe some of that was for sparkling as well, perhaps. Um, Chardonnay, everybody complains about having too much Chardonnay, and yet um, we use it a lot. But it does not command a price. It doesn't. So is it worth it for you? I don't know. You're going to have to kind of think about that. But look at these prices. These are going to help you along the path in determining whether it's worth it for you. Gewürztraminer. I love Gewürz. It does not sell. It's a hard stinking sell. Um, Syrah, not too bad. Uh, even Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, not too different from what it was uh, projected or suggested for. But again, is it worth your money, your time? Semillon sold for, for, for better. But Semillon, as far as the wine, again, not the easiest of sells. In the Midwest, it seems to do great. But out here, mm, plus or minus. Riesling, again, a hard sell above the suggested price, but is that on average per ton, is that worth your time? And that price is probably gonna translate into the price of your wine. So just take this as a guideline. There's some interesting ones here. Uh, Petit Verdot, Cab Franc, just take it as a guideline. But my point is when you start to determine these things, what your value is, what your price should be, look at these averages. And that's going to give you a compass reading on whether you should even start that down that path. This was in 2020. This is what they sold for. Now, I'll, I'll show these side by side so you can compare. Um, small note, I tweaked this tonnage specifically for Idaho. And I'll show you again side by side, and I'll show you why I tweaked them. Your tonnage will directly affect your income in two different ways. First, the obvious, it'll affect your sales uh, income, right? And it'll also affect the amount of wine you can make. That's obvious based off your tonnage. What's not so obvious and what I've talked about to the wider Idaho industry before is your tonnage will affect the likelihood of vine damage. You have a shorter, about two weeks season in the South at least, and a little bit in the north, about two weeks shorter, sometimes three weeks, than we have up here. So you have more condensed season. And so the more you're trying to crop, so the, the more grapes you're trying to grow, the harder it's going to be to bring those vines into dormancy the way they're supposed to. And if they don't go into dormancy the way they're supposed to, you're going to have a higher propensity for things like vine damage, particularly coal damage, which is a major issue in Idaho, right? It's not, the loan fix cropping lower, but it certainly will help you in your management. And so you have to wrestle that. If you're gonna produce slightly lower, how does that affect your pricing? You're going to have to think about that. Um, because if you consistently have damage, this is the inherent marketing. This is the inherent passive marketing. There's an impressive impression of inconsistency an impression of poor management, an impression of poor quality, and ultimately that will lead to cheap prices in the grapes and in the wine. And that is not something for the future of Idaho that we can do with. We have to be okay with pushing forward and trying to change that. And I think we're there. I think we're pushing forward. I think we are changing it, but it will take some years. And if all of us came into the wine industry 
only looking to make something happen for a year or two, we're, we're definitely in the wrong business. So let's look at these tonnages side by side. So these were the suggested prices going into 19. This is what they actually sold for on average. Again, many places sold for much higher than this. And this was in 2020 with some ad adjusted tonnages for Idaho. And this, these would be my suggestions for Idaho, which you should try to target for. Um, you know, Cabernet certainly went higher and higher. Um, Merlot higher, and this is what we would hope for. Pinot Noir was starting to get a little higher. Syrah higher again, Semillon. Most of these were, were fairly higher, uh, but trends. Look at the trends before you make a decision. This is only two years. You don't have to look at two years. I would never suggest you look at two years, but I wanted to get you in the process of the mindset of looking at these trends. I don't care, and you shouldn't care, how much you personally love conversion Conversion is a hard sell. Riesling is a hard sell. Pinot Gris, a hard sell. And yes, I get it. We're very independent people. You want to, oh, well, you know what? I think I could be the only one around here that plants this. I, th I you know I'm going to be the only wine producer of this grape here. Uh, everybody's going to flock to me. They're going to buy it because I'm going to be the only one. That's not how it works. That is, a, it can. That's very rare. And you're going to have to market the crap out of that one product simply because you wanted to do it. Okay. Now, no one's telling you can't, but it is going to be difficult. You are much better off looking at trends and making intelligent decisions. Now, how can your winemakers, how can they determine the worth of your vineyard? Again, these are inseparable concepts, the idea of a vineyard and wine, but many of our structures are, are quite separate. So if you're marketing to a winemaker, or if the winemaker has faith in what you're doing, but they maybe don't know how to quantify it yet, we're gonna start talking about that now. So how can the winemakers determine your worth? The first step is how much are you making? How much right now are you at? So we're gonna, we're gonna take the first steps in this conversation here. So I wanna walk you through some years. Year one, now this is not year one of planting, this is year one of selling. So this might be year three or four. You're one of selling. And, and as I go through these numbers, you guys are going to go, wow, this seems, I, I got it. It's very applicable to Idaho. So let's say your first year selling and you have about 10 acres. Of course, you can have a couple acres, couple acres less or plus or whatever. But you're only getting about a ton and a half per acre. It's still very common. And because you don't necessarily know what's going on, you don't necessarily know how to price your stuff and you haven't looked at trends, you kind of agree to about, uh, on average, uh, 1,300 a ton. Maybe one variety is more, maybe one variety is less. So you only get about a 15 tons. Now, this is not talking about your cost of production. This is just straight up. So you bring in about $19,500, but you know, in your head, everything you've read says you should be comfortably producing about four tons. So you know there's something going on here. You know you should be producing more. So you're essentially leaving out there 3,200, over 3,200 bucks, right? This is inherent marketing here. You do not have the power to command a greater price. You don't even know where to start. So your lessons learned are really, you, you know you have problems, but you don't know what those problems are and you really don't know where to start fixing those problems. Well, year two is selling. Um, maybe this year you get a little bit more, you get two tons. But again, you know, at least things you're reading, says you should be producing more. So, and you are still commanding the same price. You bring in a little bit more year two. So you think you're getting it down, but, you don't know and you think something's wrong, you're still leaving money out there because you think this is what you're supposed to be producing. Oh, but by the way, now you're starting to lose faith in all these other sources because all these sources tell you you should be producing more, but you're going, I can't produce more. So these guys don't know what they're talking about. These writers don't know anything about my location. They've never grown. They've never produced rye. They're full of it. So you do have inconsistent production. You know that. 
you haven't even gotten to proving your quality. You haven't even started conceptualizing quality. But you're going, maybe I need a little bit of help. So year three, that little bit of help, you start to kind of tweak one or two things. You get a little bit more production, um, a little bit more income, but you, you still feel like something's going on. But you're learning now, and you're still leaving money on the table, still. So now you go, wait a sec, okay, I got to invest here. I have to. I have no choice. I better be ready to start writing some checks because I need help. I need some legit consultations. I need to improve my production. And as you do this, as you start improving your production, you start to develop better industry relations with your winemakers. And they start to have a little bit more faith in what you're doing and who you are. Year four, those things are starting to pay off. That check you wrote to the consultant is paying off. The relations you're building with your winemakers are paying off, right? Your local uh, winery association is, is hiring specific help, those kind of things. This takes time and money. This takes time and money. So things start to improve. The better industry relations are helping you to command some prices, which is good. Uh, you're earning more. You still think you can produce a little bit better, so that maybe there's still some money on the table. So now you, you're, you're realizing the fruit of your, your, your effort, your labor. And this still takes investment. You better be really re ready, willing, and able to bring in the right help, okay? You better be ready to do this. So you start with some very specific consult consultations now. You gotta start getting into the weeds. And you got to continue to build your, your production, better production, and better industry relationships because these are clientele. And you better be ready to be that ambassador. So now you really start to knock it in. You're getting better production, more consistent production, certainly. You're commanding higher prices. You're bringing in more money. You think maybe you can still tweak your stuff, maybe. So, so you're perhaps not leaving stuff on the table, but you think there's potential for a little bit more. You think there is. But this is a good problem to have. This is a bad problem. This is a good problem. And so those specific consultations were paying off. You're getting good production. And now you're really having these good industry relations. People understand who you are. Now they are ambassadors of you. And now you have some good, consistent secondary marketing and probably tertiary marketing because those clients of the winemakers are now essentially ambassadors of you. So now I want to bring you to year six. Now, year six is going to be a couple different scenarios. In year six, uh, you're tweaking around. You, you feel comfortable getting a little bit more. So you learn more. Your consultations are working. You're tweaking your pruning. You're tweaking your soil management. All these different things you've been working on for some years. And you broke off the money here locally and within your business. You, you signed some checks to be able to make this happen. You better be ready, ready to do that. You're pulling in more money. You're getting better prices. Uh, and you feel comfortable that maybe you can tweak it a little bit. Again, good problem to have, right? If you don't get this, great. No big deal. So now you're in the realm where the only thing you need are some backup consultations. Right? You just need somebody to backseat you every now and then. You have that consistent production. You have consistent fruit quality. And we will talk about quality here in a second. We have proven, uh, proven fruit quantity and quality, I should say. And you have fantastic and great secondary and tertiary marketing. And this has a cascading effect. Um, and if you really are comfortable into this and you're really in that high-end winemaking, you're in your groove, right? You're in the zone. The marketing is happening. Everybody's high-fiving each other. Maybe you can even command a slightly higher price. And here we have the proven fruit quality, proven fruit quality. And now, by the way, you also have a proven region and you had a big piece of that. Your ABA is working for you, it, working for you and you're working for it. And that includes the success of the local wineries. If you have a winery or if you just have clientele that are winemakers, this is all intercha interchangeable and connected. Or, Maybe in those years you expanded because you knew something good was going to happen. Remember, you'd be willing to invest in yourself. So you expanded, you doubled your property. Uh, you, you, again, are commanding prices, bringing in more money. That's straight cash only. 
a straight cash, but you got to be ready to invest. You got to have that vision. You got to push forward with it. Or, or you've expanded because you feel like you need to expand. You're kind of doing things on your own. Um, you, you never really thought about this thoroughly. So for whatever reason, you didn't command those higher prices for whatever reason, right? Um, you see, it's the price difference between here and here. And so, yeah, you might have consistent production. You might have consistent fruit quality, but you don't really know what the quality, uh, sorry, you have consistent quantity, I apologize, quantity, but you've never really proven your quality. So maybe this is just bulk wine. Is that where you wanna be? If that's where you wanna be, that's okay. But most of us don't go out saying, I wanna do bulk wine. That's usually not the start. And you do have winemakers that are buying your stuff, but they're probably buying it because it's cheap. So that means they're probably selling their wines for fairly cheap. Or you expand and you never really sought the help. You were like, I can do this by myself. And so you never really get good consistent production. And because you never get the good consistent production, you never command the prices and you're consistently losing out on tens of thousands of dollars simply because you said, I can do it myself. You're losing out on clients. You are uh, decreasing your market value, decreasing your, uh, your clout, your ability to command prices and make negotiations. This is a business and you better be ready to invest in your business. You can expand beyond that, the same scenario, right? Where you're, you're commanding prices, you invested in help, you're, you're washing out for your stuff, you're marketing, you're that ambassador, that consistent ambassador. You have great secondary and tertiary marketing, or you did it all yourself and you move past the level at which you can manage accurately. You planted too many varieties, you never sought help, you have inconsistent production, and you're like, man, I'm just basically barely scraping by each year, barely. In some years, I don't, because you can't, uh, you don't have that marketing down because you have nothing to build the marketing on. I tried to build these realistic scenarios and I think you all could kind of look at this, even if you didn't fall into this specifically, I think you can see that these are very, very, very realistic. And this is not, again, this is not just consistent in Idaho. It is not, it is very easy to feel like your problems are only your problems. And that is not true. Many regions are dealing with the same thing. And you can get past this. And if you already started to get past it, we can continue to push you past this. Questions about this scenario before I move on? Okay. Sorry. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about promotion. Make things pretty and digestible. Okay, what do I mean by that? Again, if I was wearing a, a tank top sequence shirt, um, somebody might say I'm pretty, uh, but I don't know if what I say would be digestible because the sequence would be blinding your eyes. Okay, uh, the image, the image, ladies and gents, that's important. The background here is a, a shot from the west to the east of Red Mountain. So a lot of shots you might see of Red Mountain from different angles. Uh, Col Solare is just out of view here, hedges as well. But this is from the Yakima Valley or from the Yakima River overlooking this area. And it's actually a much more picturesque view. Uh, there's some newer plantings right up here, which actually this picture was taken before, um, before the plantings were put there. And those plantings are actually lie just beyond the ABA, which is an interesting scenario. But as, I'm gonna walk you through these, through these pictures and I want you to think about this. This picture, I think we like it. It's probably Cabernet. Cabernet has a very inherent marketing, a very great inherent marketing value where you have this very distinct blue clusters, this sort of a deep green color against it uh, over the, the brown trunk. So those color, those vibrant colors look really, really good to photograph. But I'll ask you this, what vineyard is this, ladies and gentlemen? It can be any vineyard, right? So if this picture is on your website, if this picture is on something where people are going to see, is this telling them about you? Is this telling them about your vision? If it's for your region, maybe. 
maybe. But again, that could be a million different regions. That picture doesn't tell me a gosh darn thing. This is a little bit different. Okay, we know there's this region, wherever it is, is invested in vines and they probably make a lot of wine. You know, it's dry, so it's probably somewhere like the Pacific Northwest. But is it a specific business? Is it a specific ABA? We still don't know. So if you're going to be an ambassador, your tools must also work in concert with what you're saying. So as we get down to this third picture, where we're, yes, we have these beautiful vineyards, it's hilly, it's greener. You, I don't know if you can see from the picture, but there's a, a nice little shed here, and there's a nice town there. If somebody was inclined to look at this picture, they could probably figure out where it is. There's items there that say specifically what it, where it has a multi-dimensional facet to it, where uh, somebody probably tweaks a little bit of the color. So we have uh, this, uh, these different colors in the sky. It's more appealing visually. We speak to the industry. We speak to a specific location. This picture down here says more than this, and this picture says more than this. So when you're putting out those images online, do not be okay with simply taking a picture with your phone. If it's a new iPhone, maybe. But even those, you better have a good eye. What is your picture saying? Is it very general? Or is it specific to you and your ambassadorship? All right, let's keep going with images, shall we? Which is more appealing? This or this? We know the answer, right? Very obvious. Now, a couple things on this. The picture on the left, there are plenty of vineyards like that in the Yakima, Columbia Valley that hit their points, so to speak. And a lot of times they go to larger produ production and they get blended away and that's, that's fine, right? If that's your business model. But if we are in the smaller business model, we're, we're the kind of more ideal where we're, we're selling a lot more grace, but we're more in tune with our buyers. We, we, we deal with a lot more smaller producers. We are a small producer. We certainly want the appeal of luxury. Now, going back to what I asked you before, what vineyard is this? We don't know. Let me ask you a different question. Does every row in this particular vineyard look like this? I don't know. I don't need to know. I don't need to know. Make your most visible rows and vines beautiful. Just like the signage, right? Every time someone drives by, every time someone looks at you, well, I don't, not, well, your vineyard or your estate vineyard or, or your, your winery, right? They might only have five seconds and that five seconds needs to make an impression. So uh, I, actually, I actually got this idea from a, a, a former student who, uh, his family runs a, a pretty large contracting company and, and I, I, I wouldn't have had a beer with her and I said, hey, let me ask you this question. Let me ask you a little bit about marketing because the student became a student of mine because she wants to take over the family business and realizes that the world of viticulture needs to change and she doesn't know how to do that. So she became my student. And so now we are able to talk a little bit more business because she's no longer my student. And I said, well, when you think of marketing, what are your ideas? And she goes, Joel, you know a lot more than me, way more. She goes, but I'll tell you what we do. She goes, every time there's a vineyard, the outer edges, where it's the, the end vines or the last four or five rows, we make them immaculate. So that when people drive by, they think the entire vineyard is perfect. Do that. Every time someone drives by, what is that passive marketing that is being engaged? You will not be there every week, every month. Well, depending on the size of your business. But the first thing they see needs to speak volumes. They don't need to know that the next 20 acres um, are okay. They need to know, they need to have the impression that you are perfect. Does that make sense? And it's a hell of a lot easier making four or five rows beautiful than it is the entire vineyard. Hell of a lot easier. So a small little trick. 
as far as promotion, don't forget the wine writers. I, I, I debated whether or not I should put this in there, and I said, ah, I'm doing it. Listen, I get it, okay? You're afraid to send stuff in, afraid of what they'll say. Uh, maybe you had a bad interaction with somebody some years ago, um, but they are part of our industry and they can be very valuable tools. We now have a wine writer on our staff as an adjunct professor um, at the college. I had a very interesting conversation with him and I, I learned a bit. I learned a little bit about his mentality and what he does. And he said, you know, I don't, I, before we put out anything, we ask the producers, this, this is this is what I, I, my impression, this is what I would say, this is what I would do. And if you would like me to print this, uh, then it'd be another $25 for to do it. But you asked for my evaluation, you sent the wine, you paid the $100 fee or whatever it is, and this is my professional evaluation, okay? They don't have to print anything, but it's good to get an outside opinion every now and then, okay? And also, you know, don't be afraid to hear some bad stuff. It's, it's good to get a, a different ideas out there. And if you are really doing something fantastic, then they need to know about it. They should know about it, right? The world should know about it if you're truly doing something fantastic. Now, I'll, I, will, I will also say this. Uh, the individual I had a conversation with I spoke to two and a half years ago about a subject and he came out and took a couple of pictures and that subject matter and the picture didn't come out in a publication uh, to, until two years after the fact. So you have to also wrestle with the idea that when people are, are in, the, in the business of writing and therefore promoting and marketing, they have a, a lot of things they're thinking about. And although you think you're doing something special, Maybe it's not that special, or maybe they're trying to give you the benefit of the doubt and give you the opportunity to consistently produce, to really show who you are. So that even though right at that second, you think you're doing something great, they know if you continue along your path in a year from now, it's going to be fantastic. And that's the time to write about you. So give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't ignore them. At the very least, it's nice to get an outside opinion every now and then, okay? Be aware, because there's some very expensive people out there, and there's also some very great people that will cost you a fraction of the price of some of these others. I just threw out some extremely famous people. Uh, these individuals have written, written books, are writers for the New York Times, Vogue Magazine. Um, yeah. So promotion and position. So kind of leading more into position. Um, online media, that ain't going anywhere. If you haven't engaged it yet, you better start. So this is a, an organization I followed. I first found them on LinkedIn and on LinkedIn, the owner. So the owner was a, a tech guy from down in, uh, I forget his name, but a tech guy from down in California. Of course, he made a lot of money. He says, you know what? I'm going to be an American. I'm going to go out to France and I'm going to buy a chateau, right? Uh, but he's taking this American idea of marketing with him. And I don't think he was ever a marketer, but once you go abroad, you realize how differently we think. And so everything about them online has this consistent message of upper end wine production, this consistent message of affluence, of elegance, you can, this is all their Instagram posts. I just took, you know, a fraction of them, but the vineyards, the artistry, the photography, the farming, the education, it is all one vision. And everything they do is consistent on that. Everything. I don't know the quality of the wine, but their vision is on point. And the chances are, because I already have an affluent, elegant impression in my mind that when I purchase their wine, I'm already going to, or I'm more likely to think highly of it before I even open that bottle. And at the very least, their marketing has worked. Why? Because here I am mentioning them to the state of Idaho. Think about that. Think about that. 
So, same question. Uh, how do winemakers determine your worth? Well, know your own worth. How much should you be charging? How much are you doing? How much is, is your effort worth? Are you selling the land? Are you, are you, are you selling the idea of the land where you are, your history? Um, a lot of people, they will confuse the value of the property with the value of the business. Make sure you distinguish those two things because they are not the same. When you determine what you're trying to do, whether it's plant or make wine, all that kind of stuff, look at averages, look at long-term averages. Six years would be ideal. You could do three-year average, but that's going to give you a better idea of what you should invest in and where should you invest. Again, things like Kovistri Mina and Riesling, I dig them, but they are very hard sells. And if you look at those averages, you can easily determine which of those are worth your time. Uh, example, let's say you have you know, 20 acres and eight varieties and you deal with freeze damage. Uh, you're struggling with soil management, labor, and you have an average yield of two tons to the acre. So can you guarantee a product of quantity and quality? The answer is no. You can't guarantee that. So therefore, it's difficult for your wine makers or your wine growers to really determine your worth because you can't. Chemistry. This is a tool to determine your worth. I'm going to show you how to do this but it does take training and it does take knowledge. This takes kind of what I was going back earlier, your investment in specific consultations. You better be ready to get something good. Just because somebody might, you know, be an expert in uh, ooh, geology, perhaps, um, that doesn't mean they know a gosh darn thing about growing grapes and making wine. So you better be specific about who you're bringing in and why you're bringing them in because it's going to take money, it's going to take training, it's going to take knowledge, and it's going to take time. But this is a major tool in how you define quality, okay? So here's a really good example. We're gonna close out with this example, okay? Five Cabernet Sauvignons from 2016, all from the Walla Walla Valley, ABA. Um, they were harvested between 28 September of that year and 20 October. All right. So you notice I didn't put any particular businesses or anything like that. Uh, I would, would never do that unless it's very, very positive. Um, about four weeks in between the harvests, all from the same AVA. Bricks levels. Uh, and, I, and I started out with this because this is what most people still use. Bricks, PHTA. That's all right. If that's what you're using, great. You can make wine out of that. And you can use that to sell grapes. Fantastic. We use bricks to determine the level of ripeness, but that's, a, that's sort of a mis misconception, but certainly the amount of alcohol we can make. Um, so one of them should already stand out to you. So regardless of the time it was harvested, one of them should already stand out to you. pH and TA, we're talking about the strength of your acids and the amount of your acids here. We use that to tweak. An acid is very important for the stability of your color, long-term stability of your wine course, right? Great. You can make wine off of that. Well, what else do you have? What other tools are available out there? You can break down your acids, your malic and your tartaric, of course. If you have little malic acid, uh, good luck going through malolactic fermentation. So whether you're the winemaker that's already planning this to create a smoother mouthfeel in your wines, or you're uh, a great grower trying to tell the winemaker that you have quality grapes. If you don't have any mallet going into ferment, you know, you have to start asking some questions. What about, now mainly the acid that we deal with is tartaric. Well, what about potassium? Potassium tends to come in in large amounts, tends to, depending on your region. Oh, and by the way, potassium is super important for the flow of everything. And potassium transporters almost never turn off. So potassium keeps coming in, it keeps concentrating, it keeps coming in. So if you don't have a high amount of acid, but you have a high amount of potassium, this potassium is going to directly counter this, excuse me, this. This goes against this. This knocks out two grams of acid. So now the acid that you came in with immediately, immediately gets knocked down. 
how many times has anybody made wine and kind of made some adjustments off the TA and kind of went, well, you know, the TA and pH measures are kind of general. They are general because most people don't look at these things. Yan, Yan kind of has been overly hyped. Uh, Yan, people think is a measurement of aromas, but we can fix Yan. We can fix that. What do we do? We add DAP, diammonium phosphate, um, and the results that come out almost exact, uh, scientifically speaking. And by the way, DAP is dirt cheap, dirt cheap. Well, we also have tannins and anthocyanins, which is color, color molecules, and polymeric anthocyanins. We realize I probably should have pulled this out so it says anthocyanins in one word. Um, but what are these? Well, well, tannins are the that scaffolding, right? That physical structure, that feel, you, you know, you, that grip that you get on your tongue. In order to stabilize that, you need all these other things. Anthocyanins is color, great. So the more you have, the more color you could potentially have. Polymeric anthocyanins, so that's, that's the baseline scaffolding on building all this in your wine. So the more polymeric anthocyanins you have going into your ferment, the more total anthocyanins you're gonna have coming out of your ferment. So as you break these down, this, these are tools to quantify what your grapes can be. So if I was a grower, I could be any one of these five growers and do this year after year and be able to tell my clients, hey, listen, this is the range I wish I could produce for you. These are the tools that I'm giving you in my grapes for you to make great wine. As a winemaker, shopping for grapes, you can get this information and go, you know, I'm looking for a Cabernet. I have some pretty good options, but there's clearly one option I want to drop. Now, maybe this chemistry is great for you as a winemaker, maybe, because you want a softer, lighter Cabernet. You want something you're going to sell very easily. So this isn't bad. But these tools, these numbers allow you to define quality and get away from the idea that, oh, those little grapes look great. This allows you to be a better ambassador. This allows you to sell better grapes, to consistently sell grapes, consistently make wine, know what you're actually utilizing in your winemaking process, knowing how to tweak stuff. Oh, I get, you know, a lot of tannins out of this one area. So I need to, maybe, maybe the barrels that I used to use, I, I, I tweak those barrels. Maybe I get a different barrel. Maybe I get a different producer. Maybe I get barrels from a different forest. These tools are equally as important as a wrench or grease for building a motor or fixing a pump in the cellar or fixing a tractor. These tools are commonly used. These tools are the future. This is how you can define quality. Kind of get hyped up there, huh? All right, we're gonna close this out. Of course, we should talk about stuff if, if you have questions, but I don't wanna hold you all forever, okay? So know your product, know what you're selling. Don't forget that you also selling yourself. You are a product here. Your placement, we mostly talked about that in relation to AVAs, but really, uh, where are you selling your product? Are you selling it at your winery, your vineyard? your local area, your local market, and what does that say for you? Price, um, you need to produce consistently to even talk about pricing. But look at these averages of prices and be realistic. What's worth your time? Promotion, think of everything being as a promotion. Somebody driving by your property, somebody speaking about your business, your front of the house staff, your tractor driver. Okay? Think about everything as a promotional tool, primary, secondary, and tertiary promotion. And your position. How is your product viewed? We are in a luxury product market. Okay, so think luxury, even if you're just defining luxury simply for yourself. Set the bar high for yourself. Be your own enemy. Fight against yourself to make a better product for you and ultimately for your region and the state of Idaho. Okay. Ladies and gents, that's what I got. Hopefully it was helpful. Hopefully you didn't get tired of my voice. Um, and I hope that this helps you all to really uh, bring your business to the next level. Or maybe say, you know what? I'm glad Joel spoke upon these things because that gives me the warm and fuzzy that I'm on the right path, that I'm doing some pretty cool stuff. Any questions for me, ladies and gentlemen? 
Oh, I finished right on time. Joel? Yeah. Um, this is, a lot of this was actually really good, but um, how does, on fact, like you were talking about on some of the pricing stuff, and you kind of didn't include, you know, factoring in cost of production, um, you know, for a lot of growers, I mean, that's a huge impact on how things are kind of, prices are determined too. And so, correct. also needs to be considered. So you're, you're, the reason why I didn't put that in is, is a couple reasons. Price of production on the winery, on the vineyard side is incredibly dependent on the business, incredibly dependent. And I, I mentioned earlier that um, I got the scholarship through WC to kind of study this. And then it was blatantly obvious that I, I wasn't going to learn anything. And, and the instructors approached me about it. And I was like, I'm glad you said something. There are calculators out there that can help you produce this. Um, and I did, did not find much validity in those calculators. I will tell you this. Um, the cost of your production is going to require that, what I talked about earlier, specific consultations. Uh, I won't say where, but there's a very high-end vineyard. Uh, there's a very high-end vineyard, and the vineyard manager does an amazing job. A lot of expensive wineries own spots there. And their cost of production on some of their more expensive locations is about $13,000 per acre. Now, they're farming on hills and uh, all of their winemakers and the impression of that business is that everything's going to be done by hand. And so that hand labor requires higher uh, cost of production. So they could go from $13,000 on their high end cabs per acre, they could easily go down to $6,000. But their clientele and the vision that they have, that, that mantra, is high-end hand-picked stuff or, or hand-farmed stuff. Now, if you are, <clears throat> right now, the biggest cost of production factor seems to be in, in Idaho, Southern Idaho, excuse me, and a little bit in Northern Idaho. Right now, the major cost of production seems to be replanting or retraining due to um, damage. That seems to be the highest cost of production. And I do see some heads right now shaking yes. So I, I think, I think Pat, um, I, I didn't add it because it's situational dependent, but as a general rule, the biggest issue that I've seen in, in Idaho right now is, is the replanting. So we start to fix that. You're going to get into those scenarios that I put in there where you're getting more consistent production. And once you get more consistent production, then you can start to tweak your cost. Okay, maybe it, now it's worth it to buy uh, a second mechanical weeder, or maybe it's worth it to uh, buy a, a smaller uh, mechanical harvester, those kind of things. Okay. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Anybody else? And I'm super thankful for the questions, by the way, that, that makes me, give, gives me the warm and fuzzy that people are paying attention and that. I got some, I got some gears moving up here, which is good. That's my goal. Anybody else? Well, this is Tim. Hey, a question around, you know, your SWOT analysis and that side of things. And I definitely understand your perspective of the community, right? Right. But I still think it's good for us to think about those threats because they do exist, right? I think one of the biggest ones you are experiencing right now in the state of Washington is the threat of overproduction, right? There's something we have to be able to dig into and learn from a region in Idaho to not be in the situation of overproduction that other states see or other areas see quite often, right? So Correct. again, I don't want everybody to overlook the threats that are there, understanding the community support, but there are threats from a market market exposure side of things, right? Others I think of are Correct. similar, you know, like as you mentioned, bridles. There are some bridles that, you know, making sure that we have good alignment of varietals to the region. Um, Correct. And, you know, the threats of things coming in that just don't make sense, right? That don't promote the region. Properly. Yeah, so, I, so so although I didn't specifically say threats, just because when I say threats, I, I kind of get on edge. 
Um, but I, you know, we did talk about those, you know, look at those long-term yeah. averages, see what's, yeah. what's worth it for you. Because you can, like, like you said, Tim, overexpose yourself. I don't think, and this is a danger, you know, you and I have talked about this as far as maybe focusing on other regions a little bit too much. I think the main threat for Idaho right now is underproduction. Yeah. I think that's the biggest threat right now, underproduction or, or inconsistent production. So I think we tackle that first. Um, I think Idaho is probably eight to 10 years away from overproducing. And, and Washington right, right now is uh, basically everybody's saying they're out of the idea of being over, uh, of overproducing. Everybody right now is going, crap, we overadjusted and now we need to produce more. Yeah. yeah. I just think it's good for everybody to be conscious of the threats, like you say, at times Agreed. We, we have a tendency to shy away from them. And those are the things that are really going to jump up and bite you if you really, really don't pay close attention to them, right? So Yes, that's yes. Absolutely, 100% agree. Um, I like to I like to vocalize that and put it on me. I would say, you know, be I'm I am my worst enemy, and I mean that as in whatever I'm yep. afraid of, whatever I don't want to engage in, whatever I think is a threat, I tackle it. I I, I go right for it, and that's going to require me to go through some suffering, but I'm going to come out better at the end. Anybody else? Yeah, Joel, I, I wanted to kind of circle back to a little bit about like uh, you were talking like the bricks and the pH and TA and, and the malic yes. and acid and that sampling, you know, some of that stuff, you kind of have to have wine already made. So is that something that a grower would need to? No, no, this is all, this is all grapes. This is all grapes right here. All grapes. Okay. This is all grapes. And so this is kind of what I was saying. I'm. I, Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this kind of goes into one of my points earlier where quantifying and qualifying is going to take education. It's going to take time because even in Washington, so I live in Tri-Cities, so at the tail end of the Yakima Valley. So I deal with a lot of the greater Washington industry, though I work in Walla Walla, where I deal with a more concentrated industry. In Walla Walla, I'd say 50% of the people do this. And this is something that my, my, my colleagues have been harping on for some years because people still go, wait a second, I didn't know you could get this out of grapes. So people don't know they can get it out of grapes, one. Two, they don't know how to use it. And three, they don't know where to get it. Uh, and I would, say, I would say not knowing how to use it comes from the grower and winemaker's perspective. Again, you can use a Briggs pH and TEA. Most people still do, but the most notable winemakers and vineyards in the world and in the states are already moving towards picking off of phenolics. So if you are using BRICS PATH, that's fine for now. But if you want to grow the industry, the world will move and has already started to move to picking off of phenolics. This scenario here, uh, listen, I'm going to be honest with you all. When I came into Walla Walla, my, my day job, this was from there. This was below the quality of every other cabinet we pulled. This is what I came into. Now, what I grow is above this stuff. So unfortunately for me, because the college owns the vineyards, I can't sell them for a tremendously high value. But as a report card, if I was a grower and if I was able to take this and show people, every year is going to be different, but you should be able to create these baselines and show people this is what I can produce. And then hopefully you can start to work with your winemakers. They're getting training, you're getting training, or you have more educated winemakers coming to you eventually and going, I know how to do this. You give me the quality, I know what to do with it. I know how to work with it. So then is that going to mean growers are going to need to start getting some small lab spaces set up to do these yes, tests? Or eventually, or? eventually. Um, I'll throw out, um, no, I don't want to throw out a name. Uh, there was, two years ago, we get some Riesling from a large vineyard out here in Washington, a very famous uh, vineyard. And as you can imagine, I have a really good relationship with the vineyard manager and I spoke with her. Uh, this was in Sadie Drury that I spoke to earlier, I spoke about earlier, this is another one. 
And I was speaking with her because she needed uh, an intern. And she called me and I said, hey, what's, hey, what's up, how you doing? And she goes, we're talking about these, these data points. And she goes, am I crazy? I feel like I need an intern who can work some vineyard stuff and then take samples. And I feel like we need some more data to show what our grapes are doing. And this is two years ago. And this is a very famous, very well-established vineyard in, in Washington. I told her, yeah, you're thinking the right thing, Sadie. Or sorry, it wasn't Sadie, it was somebody else. I was a slip of the tongue, but it wasn't Sadie. Um, she goes, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, you're already thinking the right thing. You're looking for an intern for my program. You don't have to hire someone for my program, but you all, this is going to take time to learn. You know, um, there's probably, if I gave, there's probably only three people, three out of every 10 growers or winemakers in Washington that do this right now. And there's probably only, only two of those three one of those three that can actually explain it really in depth, but this is the future. The basis of this and what can help you right now is that, of course, everybody wants to know this, so get that, right? This directly counters this. So if you've ever had a winemaker talk about how flabby your grapes are, maybe there's, excuse me, maybe there's a, a potassium issue. So if you have this number, they can counter it. Uh, polymeric anthocyanins, if they want a big, bold cab, they need not only tannin and anthocyanin, but they need polymeric anthocyanins, right? So that's the basis of how you can use this right now. There's a lot more to it, but you can get these numbers now, you can use them now, and you can create your baseline report card for how you're actually doing. And would this be something like ETS would be able to do this? Since ETS I don't can do this. You can yes, you can do this. Yeah, you can overnight it to them. They'll have it to you in a day or two. Yeah. Okay. What you got? You know what you could also do with ETS also is I don't know why more people don't utilize this. When you send in a sample, you can tick your AVA, and then when you log into ETS, you can go to the uh, there's like an AVA portion, and when you click on that, and let's say you go okay, um, Snake River, boom. And then you can click on polymeric anthocyanins. And it won't say any businesses, but it'll create a graph for you. So everybody else that submitted and got that analysis from that region, you can see where you're at in comparison to them. Of course, you need to know your number to know which dot is yours, right? But you can see the general trend for that AVA for that component. It doesn't give anybody's information. It just shows the general trend for the AVA. So, you know, historically, we talked about quality, specifically for vineyards, and, and unfortunately, this is still true, unfortunately, where somebody will spend way too much money on somebody, and that person will come out and they'll taste some grapes. They go, oh, those are, those are the good stuff over there. You know, can you please write me my check for me coming out for two hours for $20,000? That would be great. Take it easy. My tongue is worth $20,000 for an hour. You know, or, or, you can spend some time, take these samples, have someone run it, and actually have some numbers on how you're doing as a grower. Anybody else? So these are all short-term and long-term things everybody should be thinking about. And I hope that I was at least um, a little bit helpful. Hopefully I got some conversation started. And uh, that's, that's all I got. Oh, it looks like we have one or two more questions. Uh, okay, cool. Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Are we good, Ashley? Yep, we're good. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.